Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Distributed Agile Development, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Remotes. My name is Arthur Richards. I'm the Team Practices Lead at the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, for those of you who might not know, the Wikimedia Foundation is a nonprofit organization that helps keep the lights on for Wikipedia and other similar projects. So this talk is really the story of how the Wikimedia Foundation's mobile web engineering team became a successful and high-performing team. The mobile web engineering team achieved its success in part because of the fact that we embraced distribution. Ultimately, we believe that embracing distribution is essential for achieving high performance. And before I go further, I ought to mention, um, I've been working on the mobile web engineering team for a little over the last two years. Um, I started out on the engineering team working as a software engineer myself, uh, and later became the scrum master for the team. So this might not come as a huge surprise uh, or sound crazy, but distribution is painful, particularly at first. And I think that this is something that is not to be feared or shied away from. Rather, it's something that you should walk straight towards so that you can earn the massive benefits of having or embracing remoteness on your team. One of the reasons that this is such a valuable approach is because in one way or another, we're all remote at some point or another. And this is true even on co-located teams. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. So the mobile web engineering team at the Wikimedia Foundation is an agile team. Is everybody in here familiar with agile? I should say, is anybody not familiar with agile? Cool, OK. So there's a, one of the agile principles says that the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is through face-to-face -face conversation. So how do we deal with that seeming contradiction when we're talking about a distributed agile team? So we'll be talking a little bit about that in a bit as well. So let me set the stage for you guys. Um, back in January of 2012 is when I joined the mobile web engineering team. At the time, there were two other engineers on the team, one of whom was already remote. We had a product manager as well as the director of the department. At the time when I joined um, the team, I was working at Wikimedia Foundation headquarters, which is in San Francisco. Shortly after I joined the team, my wife got into graduate school at the University of Arizona in Tucson. So this was a bit of a difficult decision, but I managed to convince my boss to let me go remote. So I moved to Tucson, Arizona, following my wife, uh, so that she could attend grad school. And this was pretty groovy, because I really didn't want to have to leave the Wikimedia Foundation, and I definitely didn't want to have to leave my wife behind. Uh, so we managed to make it work. At first, though, it was a complete disaster. <laughs> It was insanely difficult and super painful. And this is a bit of a no-brainer, but that's because distribution, distribution really exacerbates communication problems on the team. But we decided to treat this as a challenge, as uh, an opportunity for us to be able to solve um, this really big problem in order to earn the benefits. At the time, uh, the only benefit in my mind of this was the fact that I could be with my wife and keep my job. Uh, but we found through going through the process of um, improving our team that there were actually massive, massive, massive other benefits for the entire team when we decided to embrace this notion of distribution. So when I first went remote, it became painfully obvious that we had serious workflow problems. Here's how we worked. All of our work was tracked on a wiki being the Wikimedia Foundation and the stewards of the MediaWiki project. This is probably not a surprise, but we do a lot of our work, our collaborative work, on wikis. Uh, unfortunately, a wiki is not a particularly great project management tool, um, in part because anybody can edit it. Uh, but also, the, at least the way that we were using it, work was getting listed out on a wiki page in very, very vaguely defined terms, and it was never very clear who was working on what when. You were supposed to say, oh, I'm working on this, when you picked up a task but that didn't always happen, so sometimes you'd even run into issues of two people working on the same thing at the same time and not even realizing it. We also had multiple people on our team setting priorities for us. We had our product manager telling us one thing one day, and then the next day or another moment, our director might shift the priorities on us. So they weren't always in line, but they were both responsible for setting our priorities. 
It was also never clear when we were actually done with the work that we were doing. I would think that my work was done um, based off of the, the vague definition on the wiki page. I would check my work in and move on to some other task. When the PM or the director got around to actually looking at what I did, there was always the inevitable, well, what if we move this element over here and change this color? Or even worse was, dude, you did it totally wrong. So as a result of this, there was just endless context switching happening on our team. Bouncing between the different tasks um, to finish work that I thought was already done um, and having to respond to these shifting priorities. And I have yet to meet a software engineer who th can comfortably handle context switching when they're trying to write software. Personally, I need long, uninterrupted periods of time in order to actually be effective at my job. So this context switching was very poisonous, not only for myself, but for the entire team. Also, it was never clear what exactly I ought to do next. Even though the work was listed on um, the wiki, priorities didn't always stay up to date on the wiki. So after uh, I had moved to, um, to Tucson, I would have to call up the product manager or call up my boss, the director, and say, hey, dude, like I'm finished. Which, what's the next thing I should tackle? Uh, and this was kind of OK when I was working out of the office in San Francisco. But when I was working alone in Tucson, sometimes I couldn't get a hold of these guys. So I wasted a huge amount of time sitting around twiddling my thumbs, waiting to figure out what's the next thing I ought to be doing. So after doing this for a while, a light bulb went off in my head. There was nothing that had changed about how we were doing our work. The only thing that had changed was the fact that I had gone remote, that I had moved to Tucson, Arizona. And I realized that co-location obscures bad practices. It was really easy to ignore all of this dysfunction and all of these problems baked into our team when I was in San Francisco because I had the benefit of being able to very easily talk to whoever was in the office. So we were able to kind of skirt the fact that there was all this dysfunction on the team just by virtue of sitting in the same room. So my first response to this was to help the team uh, embrace Agile. So from a number of past experiences uh, working on Agile teams and helping other teams also to um, embrace an Agile mindset, I knew that Agile in and of itself doesn't actually solve problems on teams. Rather, it exposes them. So by embracing an Agile mindset and leveraging the Scrum framework, which is what, uh, how we work on the mobile web engineering team, these things gave us the tools that we needed in order to uh, be able to identify the issues that we were having on our team and ultimately to resolve them. So we realized very early on, of course, that uh, like nearly all problems on any team, the root cause was really something wrapped up in communication, which again was ultimately super exacerbated by the fact that I was remote and that we had another remote person on our team. And we just didn't have the mechanisms in place to be able to actually facilitate good communication. The nice thing about um, adopting the Scrum framework is it gave us a set of rituals. And by rituals, I don't mean ritual sacrifice or throwing virgin to volcan volcanoes or anything like that, but rather the regular and predictable meetings that come along with the Scrum framework, having retrospectives, daily stand-ups, backlog grooming, things like that. This was actually incredibly valuable as a remote person because it gave us those very real touch points of face-to-face -face communication on the team in spite of the fact that we were remote. Previously, we were never doing any of these kinds of big team meetings, or if we did, they were very haphazard. And sometimes remote folks wound up not getting involved or not getting included in those meetings. But having these, this sort of regular and predictable cadence gave us that moment to get together as a team on a regular basis and actually communicate and figure out the work that needed to be done. Early on, we took a long, hard look at the tools that we were using in order to help us uh, get our work done. I talked about some of the old ones, namely just using a wiki. Um, but at the end of the day, we wound up adopting a whole different suite of tools uh, in order to ultimately facilitate better collaboration on the team. I don't think I really have enough time to go into the specific tools that we've been using or how we've been using them. But a couple of the quick highlights um, is that we started using uh, asynchronous project management tools. Uh, previously, we were using a tool called Mingle, and we're now using Trello. Um, but this was great, because these tools are actually designed for project management as opposed to a wiki. We also started leveraging um, video chat very aggressively for all of our meetings. 
Um, and we shifted how our team communicated from something that was primarily done face to face in the office to relying much more heavily on text based communication. We already used IRC, um, uh, Google Chat, um, mailing lists, and stuff like that in our day to day lives, but we started using those much more heavily as a team, specifically for team communication. But the tools in themselves are not enough. The tools in themselves didn't actually solve our problems. Through our retrospectives, we started to compile um, a bunch of norms, rules for our team to live by. And we publicly documented these norms uh, in order to help us better collaboratively enforce our best practices. Having them documented allowed us, whenever we were drifting away from the things that we agreed on as a team, we could always go ahead and point back um, to the things that we had come up with and steer the team back into the right direction. So we have quite a few norms that we've come up with over the last couple of years, um, but I'll touch on a few of the most important ones um, that I think are probably valuable beyond just our team. Number one is if it didn't happen on the mailing list, then it never happened. This is a concept that we didn't actually come up with. We, in fact, we stole this from the Apache community guidelines. Um, but the idea here well, this was really a response to the fact that um, often decisions were getting made in the San Francisco office, and those decisions weren't necessarily being communicated to anybody else. Or if those decisions actually were communicated to other people, what wound up often happening is that everybody on the team had a different understanding of what that decision was. By getting it on the mailing list and requiring that those decisions be put there meant that all of those, de all of those decisions were getting archived and they were also searchable. So if there was ever any question about the decision that was made, you could always go back and look through the mailing list and be able to point back to the specific decision that was made. So one of the challenges that I'm sure any of you who have spent time in online communities or do a lot of text-based stuff probably already know is that text-based communication can be a total trap, right? Because it's impossible to hear somebody's inflection in the writing, and it's very easy to potentially misinterpret what somebody meant um, because you can't actually hear their tone. This is particularly true if somebody is, say, being sarcastic. You also wind up losing out on all of the subtle nuances of body language, of facial expressions that really impregnate a lot of meaning into the speech when we're speaking. Plus, we also have non-native speakers on our team. They might not have as rich a vocabulary or, or as strong a command of, of uh, grammatical structure, so on and so forth. So sometimes text-based communication with them could be a little bit rough around the edges. So in all of this, we have, we've agreed to always assume good faith. And again, this isn't something that we necessarily come up, came up with on our own. In fact, this concept of always assuming good faith is a guiding principle in all of the Wikimedia projects, and at least in all of the Wikimedia communities. But it's something that we weren't necessarily practicing very much on our team. So once we made this actually um, a part or, or, or one of our norms, we suddenly saw a drastic reduction in the conflicts that were arising as a result of the text-based communication inside of our team. Another one is the rule of three. Three here represents the three disciplines that comprise our engineering team. Engineering itself, product, and design. And the idea here is if there's ever a meeting that's going on that could have some sort of impact on the product or the direction of the product or whatever, there needed to be at least one representative from each of those disciplines in the meeting. Having input from all these three different very crucial perspectives for a product made it so that we were suddenly making much more informed and better decisions earlier on about our product and not having to have, um, go back after two people made a decision and uh, sort of shoehorn in, say, the engineering perspective after the decision had already been made. And finally, face-to-face -face communication from time to time. And what this means is having regular in-person get-togethers periodically. We don't do this super often on our team, particularly because we have people all over the place, like Russia and stuff, and it's very expensive to fly people, uh, say, to San Francisco. But we've been trying to do this at least twice a year, where we get everybody in the same room together and hang out for a week or so. And when we do this, we don't spend that time heads down at our computers doing our normal day job. In fact, we do a lot less of that, and we take um, a, a big chunk of that time and use it for doing something fun, 
going out. Uh, for instance, one of the last things that we did was we went to this place called House of Air in San Francisco. House of Air is basically a giant warehouse full of trampolines. And so we just went for the afternoon and goofed off. And this was such a fantastic thing to do with the team because it allowed us to become much closer as human beings, as individuals, to better get to know one another on the team. This helped drive a lot of empathy between everybody on the team. And ultimately, it helped us all put, our, uh, put faces to the text that we were seeing on our screen every single day. So this really helped, I don't know, facilitate, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a sense of teaminess uh, for us. And it has been a, a really crucial and very special time for all of us. So perhaps with the exception of the face-to-face -face from time to time thing, does what I've just been describing sound like it's valuable only for distributed teams? I see a couple people shaking their head no. And I think that's absolutely right. A lot of this stuff is good for teams, period, right? But they're, they're absolutely crucial for being able to find success as a remote team and being able to reap all of its rewards. This notion that we are all remote eventually became a mantra on our team. Rather than thinking of the remote people on our team as second-class citizens or uh, as an afterthought, the entire team began to think of themselves in this way, even the folks who are based in San Francisco. As the team grew, um, the, the, our engineering team uh, pretty much doubled its size since I first joined back in 2012. And at this point, almost everybody on the team is actually based in San Francisco. There's just myself who is remote as the scrum master as well as one of our other team members. And I think a lot of people, actually a lot of people when I tell them that I'm a remote scrum master for this team are like, you've got to be kidding. That's got to be an absolute nightmare. But it's not. I'm actually still incredibly effective and I would say I'm probably about as effective as I would be if I was in the office. And the reason we've been able to achieve this is precisely because of this mindset that we've all adopted. We are all remote. Even on a co-located team, team members are going to have to be remote at some point. Working from home, maybe they have to travel for the job or go visit a sick loved one and can't take the time off from work. They fall sick themselves, whatever. These are things that are typically massive disruptions for teams, right? When somebody ups and, and, and leaves last minute or, or can't be in the office. And for a team that's entirely co-located and has all of their practices based around being co-located, this can have a totally crippling effect on the team. But because we've had this mindset that we are all remote and have used that to guide our decisions in terms of how we operate as a team, we've finally become equipped to be able to support anyone on the team being remote at any time, ultimately minimizing any downtime on the team as a result of these very regular occurrences. What all this means is that our team has become incredibly resilient. We can weather, like I said, what would otherwise be massive disruptions to the team. Another one of the big benefits to all of this is the fact that it gives you freedom. It gives everybody on the team freedom, even the folks who are based in San Francisco. They can travel whenever they want. They can go wherever they want, so long as they have a decent enough internet connection to be able to communicate with us. Uh, this is pretty huge on our team, in part because uh, two of the guys on our team have serious travel bugs. Even though they're based in San Francisco, they, they very regularly, probably almost once a quarter, get up and go on some massive uh, expedition to Belize or India or whatever, but they continue working while they're doing this. And that's okay. It doesn't necessarily have a negative impact on our team. Another one of the probably pretty obvious benefits to embracing this notion of remoteness on your team is it suddenly gives you a massive hiring pool. Suddenly the entire globe is your hiring pool. You don't have to worry about people who can only come into your office. It doesn't have to be somebody who's local. It doesn't have to be somebody who uh, needs to relocate. And this is a pretty, pretty significant thing. You suddenly get access to all of this talent around the world. Yes? Yeah, so, and that's, that's why we don't actually do the face-to-face -face from time to time thing super often. We do it maybe once or twice a year um, because it's so expensive to fly folks from all the corners of the world. Uh, for travel in particular or? Um, I'm actually not sure. I don't control the budget 
So I have, I have no idea. But I, I, enough, enough budget for us to be able to do this a few times a year. How many people is that usually? Um, at one point, that was as many as five or six people. Um, currently, that's probably a much smaller number, probably closer to like two or three. I'm sorry, I can't hear you back there. Uh, so right now, we've got a guy who's in um, the UK, sorry, in Russia, and then myself in Tucson. Um, and we've got another guy who's in India. In San Francisco, usually. Well, that's actually not entirely true. We have made great use of this hiring, uh, of, of the fact that we do have a huge hiring pool. We have people on our team that are originally from the United Kingdom. Uh, we've got one guy who's from Iran. We have a couple of guys from India. Um, and a bunch of them have elected to move to San Francisco just to be in San Francisco for the heck of it, uh, or because they really just wanted to be there. Um, but so anyway, yeah, we have definitely taken advantage of the fact that we have access to this huge hiring pool. And beyond our team, um, I would say probably about 50% or so of the staff at the Wikimedia Foundation is based outside of the United States. How many people work for the foundation? About 200. There's a question over here. Uh, so are you doing daily stand-ups? Um, our team does not actually do daily stand-ups. Uh, we've been doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday stand-ups. So we do three a week. Correct. Yeah. Well, we're, we've, been, we've been fortunate on our team um, that we haven't actually had to grapple too much with the time zone issue. Uh, that is definitely a big challenge that people who are working on a globally distributed team have to cope with. Uh, but most of the guys on our team, like the, like the guy in Russia, who's probably the farthest time zone away from San Francisco or Pacific hours, he's a total night owl. So he generally overlaps quite a bit with our regular Pacific hours. Um, are probably the same way that you do any any time, but right? you know we have the we have the, the time box, the which means that we never ever 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 go over 15 minutes, no matter what. Um, and the, at this point, the team is just so used to it that people are able to communicate very e efficiently and effectively. Uh, that in fact, we usually finish with time to spare in our standups. Uh, we use uh, Google Hangout. So one of the other things about this hiring pool issue, besides the fact that you suddenly have access to this global hiring pool, it also actually increases your hiring pool locally. I'm not sure about uh, all of the other software organizations or companies that are out there, but I know that at the Wikimedia Foundation, some people have uh, criticized the foundation for not necessarily being particularly family friendly just because of sort of the intensity of the work and, and so on and so forth. But by giving people the opportunity to be able and flexibility to be able to work from home, suddenly locally, you brought in your hiring pool to people who might need to uh, work from home a few days a week or periodically. Along with increasing the hiring pool, you also really increase or at least increase the potential for diversity on your team. And by this in particular, I mean the cultural diversity. For us, working on a global product, it's incredibly valuable to have people working on our team with cultural perspectives from outside of the United States. This is really crucial for things like localization, um, people with familiarity with, say, right to left languages. On the mobile team, this means that we have people who have access to devices that we don't easily have access to in the United States, so we can get better test coverage. Um, also, we have people who typically experience very different network paradigms than we're used to in the United States maybe slower internet, maybe less reliable internet, so on and so forth. So having people who have direct experience or are currently experiencing these sort of different paradigms allows us to more early, uh, earlier on include those perspectives in the products that we're building, allowing us to build a better product from the beginning. How many of you have been woken up at 3 a.m. by an emergency call, having to fix a broken website or something like that? Yeah, so you all know that it sucks. It's horrible, it's a total nightmare. But when you have people that are spanning time zones, again, this isn't necessarily entirely uh, something that affects us on the mobile web team, but in general, if you have people spanning time zones around the globe, suddenly you don't have to get woken up at 3 a.m. to fix the site that went down. You can call the dude in Russia or have the guy in Russia take care of it for you. So all of this, the, the resilience, the autonomy, the freedom, the hiring pool, the, the, the cultural perspectives, et cetera, et cetera, I think ultimately really helps 
increase team satisfaction. And when you have a satisfied team, that ultimately leads to a much better product. So those of you that are familiar with Agile, and it seemed like pretty much everybody in the room is with the concept, probably know about this particular Agile principle. The most efficient and effective method of communication, uh, of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. So first of all, duh, of course, this is entirely true. Face-to-face -face communication is the lowest latency form of communication there is, period. However, time and time again, I have seen this principle used as a justification um, to force co-location of teams all of the time. I've also seen this principle used to say, agile can't be done on your team if you're not co-located. And I think that both of these perspectives and both of these interpretations are bad and super wrong. It's very dangerous, I think, to take that principle or really any of the Agile principles out of context. Taken on its own, this ignores that reality that we're all remote. I don't think any of the Agile principles were ever intended to be taken as gospel in spite of the fact that some people do. In fact, a lot of people do. I don't think that Agile is supposed to be a dogmatic thing. It's just a principle, right? It's not a rule. If you take that principle as gospel, you might have very immediate gains on your team, getting the benefit of all of that super, super low latency face-to-face -face communication, but you lose out on all of those benefits that we talked about. And I think the most important benefit that you lose out on there is the resilience that this helps bake into your team. And besides, we're actually able to achieve some semblance of face-to-face -face communication um, thanks to video chat. And what about this aspect of the Agile Manifesto? That we value responding to change over following a plan. Since the Manifesto and the principles were written, the technology has evolved tremendously. Now it's actually pretty easy and super cheap. In fact, it's even free to use video chat. So I think that in the true Agile spirit, we're actually responding to that change, leveraging the technology to allow us to be able to do this stuff in order to become a better, healthier team. So with all of that, I've been scratching my head for a long time. Should, the, uh, should this Agile principle be changed? And I'm not sure, I don't have an answer for this, but it's a question I'd like to posit for all of you, particularly if you're at all involved in the Agile community. I think this is something that's really worth exploring. Again, that Agile principle in and of itself is not wrong. In fact, it's totally true. However, the fact that it's been leveraged to um, really limit teams and, their, and teams' potential, I think, is a very dangerous thing. And I think that we probably need to reevaluate all of this stuff, particularly in light of the fact that, tech, that, that the technology has really evolved to make it possible to do all of this stuff as a remote team. So that's pretty much the bulk of the stuff I want to talk about. So I'm going to start wrapping up now. Ultimately, the mobile web engineering team at the Wikimedia Foundation has consistently been held up as a model team. And it's been praised as one of, if not the highest performing teams at the foundation. And I think it's all because of this. If we hadn't re embraced remoteness and distribution on our team, it would have taken us way, way longer to realize the extent of our dysfunction as a team going back to that totally busted workflow that we had going on that we were able to just sort of navigate our way around by virtue of the fact that we were all in the same room. We would have put way less effort into actually resolving those problems with the kind of precision that we've been able to since. So ultimately, we chose to approach remoteness as an opportunity, an opportunity to improve and build resilience into our team. We didn't run away from this notion of distribution or remoteness on our team. And we certainly didn't try to pretend that we could live in a world where remoteness doesn't exist or shouldn't exist or is something that can be uh, eradicated. Instead, we fully embraced it. And because of that, uh, we've discovered and continue to fine tune really great practices that allow us to be a super high performing and very successful engineering team. Ultimately, we were able to turn what others would consider a complete recipe for failure into a recipe for winning. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, actually, before, before anybody claps or anything, questions? Yeah.
What do you mean? That is, I think, what happens when you embrace Agile, whether you make the A capitalized with dogmatic or not. It's all, uh, most of it. I, I think I, uh, I would argue that the question of whether or not you need to change an Agile tenant that's maybe a little crusty or phrased from another era is ultimately eradicated. There's a kind of weird meta Zen thing happening in the Agile mentality that you can also change in Agile. Yeah. If you really embrace the mentality, and, and that's what most of it's about. I think we that's. Just tried doing this, and it utterly failed. And we're agile. That's how we learn. I, th I think that's totally right, right? You're talking about embracing like the actual ethos of agile, that that response yeah, response to change. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and I think like that, that big A agile that you're talking about is that, that notion of, of super dogmatism and, and strict adherence to a certain set of practices or the, the principles or, or, or what have you. And I think that um, teams that tend to do that tend to not be particularly successful teams. Being able to um, be able to evolve with that mindset is what really ultimately enables that success. In the back? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, pre I think pretty much all of the teams at the Wikimedia Foundation interface to varying degrees with the volunteer community, but there's always some amount of um, uh, contributions that we help facilitate or manage or whatever within the, the volunteer community. So um, the, the model that I think has been most successful for the Agile teams at the Wikimedia Foundation around that is, you know, we have our, the, the teams, the paid teams have uh, their product direction pretty explicitly spelled out, or at least in terms of the goals that we're trying to achieve over the course of a quarter or the year or whatever. Um, and inside of that, you know, we write our user stories and we work on our user stories and we have priorities and so on and so forth. Um, but that tends to stay, that stuff tends to stay in the domain of the team itself. But we have this like humongous, every team has a humongous laundry list of, of stuff that we'd love to get to, but just doesn't necessarily fit into the priorities. Um, or might be stuff uh, that is just like too nebulous for us to get into at this moment. Um, and those are the very low hanging fruit usually for somebody, to, uh, somebody from outside the team to come pick up and work on in whatever time that they have. Also, you know, we get drive-by contributions from people who are just scratching their own itch that might not have anything to do with the particular um, uh, priorities or needs of the specific product. And, um, the, the, the teams that are responsible for a particular product area will usually you know, do the code review on that and evaluate whether or not it's something that ought to be plugged into the product wholesale. So it's definitely something that we uh, try to set some time aside for in our day-to-day -to, -day to work with the volunteer community um, and to actually make sure that we can strike this balance between having the sort of very clear uh, uh, mandate of stuff that we have to achieve but also still be able to work very closely with our, our uh, contributor community. No, um, we haven't, and I haven't really seen that done, um, at least in the sense of working them into like those regular rituals and picking up the same kind of work that we're, we're tackling. Um, we do involve them, you know, just through general communication. Our most, actually for us, excuse me, for us, all of our, um, all of our meetings are, are public. Like anybody can come and join. So periodically we'll get somebody uh, from the community or people from the community who come to our showcases or retrospective or something like that. The back green shirt. Uh, at your stand-ups, like generally, what's the format for the stand-up meeting? Is it just if you have something that you're blocking on, that you can bring that up, or that you do like sort of round, uh, go around and We do we do a go around, um, and everybody answers three questions. What did you do since the last time you met? Uh, since the last time we met? What are you going to do, or what are you planning on doing until the next time we meet? And is there anything standing in your way? <laughs> how, how do you facilitate, because one of the things in the sort of prototypical co-located or more co-located than not agile scrum master is a, 
is that you know if, if a flash meeting breaks out, two developers, one developer says, I need to talk to someone who's more of a backend expert, hash this out. The scrum master is usually close enough by to sort of know that this is going on and step in if it looks like it's going to take an hour right. to say, hey, you know what? You got five minutes to finish up your conversation. Pick one of these, and then that's what we'll try. And if it fails, we'll go back. Yeah, that's actually that. that's that's a really good question. Um, you you definitely lose out on that ability to be um, that kind of gatekeeper uh, that I think a lot of that kind of role that a lot of scrum masters play. Um, I would say that uh, for us, particularly since that we've shifted our primary communication uh, into text-based media, particularly IRC for day-to-day -day stuff. Even folks in the office coordinate on IRC so probably more. Yes, so I'm able to see when that kind of stuff is happening. I'm always watching IRC. Um, sure, those things definitely happen uh, in meet space that I don't know about, right? Um, you, and fortunately, I think that our team is at a pretty mature level in terms of agility and so on and so forth. And usually, if somebody feels like things are spiraling and they need help, somebody will call me or text me or grab me on, on IRC or something, uh, and then I can step in and help facilitate those sort of ad hoc meetings. Mm -hmm. So you're using Scrum, is that right? Yes. So uh, previously, when we started doing all of this, we used a tool called Mingle. Uh, it's a proprietary tool created by a sort of agile consulting company called ThoughtWorks. Um, and I, as Scrum Master, really love that tool, but it was a little bit overly complicated for most of our users. Um, and we've recently uh, switched to using Trello, which is a super lightweight task management system. Um, and there's a, a Chrome extension that we use on top of Trello called um, I think it's just called Scrum for Trello, that allows you to uh, add estimation points and things like that into the Trello cards. Um, it's not the best tool from my perspective for what we're doing, um, but inside of the, the Wikimedia Foundation, we're getting ready to shift everything wholesale over to an open source tool called Fabricator. And when I say everything, I mean everything from our code management, um, so all, our, our Git repositories will be managed inside of Fabricator, um, our bug management, we're currently using Bugzilla, but we're going to start using Fabricator. Um, and also our project management stuff is going to switch to Fabricator. The project management tools inside of Fabricator currently are not, in my opinion, super mature. Uh, but the Fabricator developers are super interested in having, seeing the Wikimedia Foundation start using this tool. And they've, they've been super responsive in helping us sort of direct uh, how the, the, the um, project management tools are evolving. Um, so I would expect that that's something that we'll start using probably in the next few months. So when, you're, when your team switched to using Scrum from basically not being in, like uh -huh. how much experience did your team have with Agile and Scrum? None. I was the only one on the team who had experience uh, with Agile before. Did you have a question? That's a good question. Um, it was really hard at first to figure out how to make the whole remote thing actually work for me. Um, it's really easy when you're a remote worker to never be able to escape your work. Um, at least if you're like if you're invested in it, you really believe in what you're doing and love it. Um, you know, for a long time I was rolling out of bed and just kind of stumbling over to my desk, and I would start my day. And then suddenly, like 10 or 12 hours would go by, and I'd be like, oh, what? And then I'd stumble over to dinner, and then go back to work, and then go to bed. And it was a really unhealthy, just kind of crappy way to live. <laughs> um, but eventually, um, uh, I moved into a house that I was able to actually have a separate office space from the rest of my home. Um, and I set up rules for myself, which were that I only go into the office during regular work hours. And I typically avoid the office any other time of day besides that. So I just sort of created my own mini workspace and was able to um, just sort of set those boundaries for myself. And now I actually really feel that I'm able to get a hell of a lot more done at home um, within, within that rubric than I ever was when I was working in the San Francisco office. That is tax too. Also true. Also true. Okay. Any other questions? 
Quinn, you mentioned the, uh, you, you, your team's been together for a while, I guess, at this point? Yeah, and uh, some, some of the folks, well, I've been on the team now since January 2012, so about two and a half years. Um, two of the other guys on the team have been there since then, uh, but we've added a few folks um, over the course of the last two years. Uh, the product owner, product manager, and our designers have changed uh, much more frequently than the engineers. Anything else? Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Right now, uh, f uh, five. Okay. So uh, that's pretty much a wrap. Um, we're hiring. We have all different kinds of positions open. Um, <laughs> not, if you're, not if you're working on my team. Um, I actually know a lot of the positions that we have open are uh, open to um, uh, remote employment. So we have jobs open in engineering, design, product, other aspects of the Wikimedia Foundation world, volunteer management, stuff like that. Um, we're uh, currently about to close one Scrum Master position. Uh, but we also currently have a Scrum Master position um, that's open that we're looking to fill. So if anybody is in that space or is an Agile coach or something like that, please come talk to me. And uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of me outside of uh, right now or OS Bridge in general, it's my email address. Um, this is me on Twitter, although I don't really use Twitter very often. And you can find me often um, on IRC and Freenode uh, in this channel. And that's it. Thank you guys very much.